Hi everyone, um, I'll be talking about uh, TDD, which uh, some of you may mistakenly know as uh, test-driven development. Everybody knows TDD as uh, test-driven development, I guess, yeah. I'll show you uh, a different meaning, uh, a more interesting meaning, I hope. So, uh, I'm online, so if you have uh, questions or uh, suggestions or insults, uh, you can direct them to, uh, to my Twitter account and uh, I'll try to, to answer them. Um, just to uh, introduce myself quickly, uh, I work for a company called Clever Cloud. It's a platform as a service. Um, you just git push your code and uh, it's hosted. You don't have to manage your software updates, uh, restarting application when they crash, we handle uh, all that. So if you want to give it a try, just come talk to me uh, after the talk. And um, I would describe myself as a functional programming, uh, functional programmer, sorry. Um, I started by being a, a regular object-oriented programmer. And um, I've switched to uh, functional programming for a very simple reason. I'm dumb. And I make dumb mistakes all the time. So having principal tools helped me a lot in uh, catching those dumb mistakes. Let's start with a simple example. Um, let's say we have uh, a web an HTTP API. We give it uh, a number in the query string, and we just want to, to add five to this number. So first uh, implementation, naive implementation, would be this method. Um, we get a map string string, uh, representing the query string. And um, first thing we get uh, is a parameter called number. If it's not an empty string, uh, we try to parse it as an integer. And then we return this integer plus five. And if it's an empty string, we just return zero. So looks like it should work. And it does indeed work in some cases. If you give it uh, a query string, where it's effectively a number parameter, and if this number is a series of digits, then it works. If you don't give it any parametrical number, then you get a null pointer exception. And uh, if you give it a number parameter which is not a number, you get a number format exception. So what we usually do to uh, avoid this uh, exception is something we call uh, Pokemon-driven development. <laughs> Got to catch them all. So um, we first had uh, null checks, um, and then we had uh, a try catch block. So. It's um, somehow familiar and uh, what, uh, what we should do. Uh, now, we can see that um, the code is starting to not be like the specification. So it's still manageable, but it's, it's a start. Uh, if we want now to, uh, instead of just adding five, uh, we just want to add two numbers. Um, the safe way to do that is uh, this kind of code. So imbricated null checks, uh, try catch blocks, and everything. And uh, if you move uh, a single line from uh, outside the try catch block, uh, try catch block, or uh, the null check, then it will blow up at runtime. time. And frankly, this is not the kind of code uh, I like to write, and even more to read. So. Let's, step a let's take a step back and uh, try to uh, think with types instead of uh, just trying to imagine uh, all the runtime's error. The first possibility of error is that when we get a map and we ask a value um, from this map, you maybe have a value. If there is a defined key, then you get a value, else you don't get anything. So we can, uh, instead of just asking for a parameter, define a function where you get a map and the key, and it, won't, it will give you maybe a string, not a string or an exception or whatever. It's encoded in the type that maybe you won't have any result. Um, the other, 
other thing from a string, I can parse an integer, maybe. If it's a series of digits, yes, I can parse an integer. Uh, if it's not, then I don't have anything meaningful. So we have a, we can define a method parse int uh, returning a maybe int. So structurally, we can abstract it into uh, something called the option type. So either we don't have anything, uh, or we have a value. So let's rewrite our methods uh, in terms of this. So we have a function parse it from string to option of int. And uh, we have a method get on a, on a map, which uh, returns an option of uh, the value contained in the map. Then we can combine these two functions. And we get a function get int, which tries to get the parameter and then tries to parse it. So what we have is that we have a clear uh, data flow. And at each uh, step, we can see that it can fail. The fact that we return an option shows that each step can fail. So we can clearly see where the failures are. And with that, the, fa the final code is that. So comparing to this, I think it's a bit better. We can clearly see that uh, we are introducing a default values in the last line, when we call get or else zero. So we provide a default value if the option is, uh, is not defined. I think that's a bit better. <laughs> and what we have is that code that is correct by construction. Because if we tell in the types that it's maybe a value, we can't construct code that will try to use the value regardless. We are forced at some point uh, either to get the maybe going or to introduce a default value. We just can't get, uh, can't ask for a value without handling the error case. And uh, other um, way to, to say that, it's code that's obviously correct because it's if you want to, to do bad things, it's visible in the code. So of course, for a simple example as like that, a uh, test would have been uh, a solution. But the, the real question is not why use types over tests. It's why not only use tests? And there is a very simple reason for that, is that with tests, uh, you only get uh, answers for very specific cases. So you have to think yourself of these cases, and then you verify the work, but you, you don't have any exhaustivity. For instance, let's say you want to uh, test this simple function. It takes an integer, and it returns an integer. The number of test cases you have to write on our 32 byte systems is this. More recent systems, that. It's uh, quite a big number of, uh, of tests to write. And even worse, uh, if you have uh, types with an arbitrarily big number of uh, values inside them, like a string, it's only bounded by the amount of memory you have on your system. Then you get an arbitrarily big number of test cases to, to have. So we can't prove any s everything with that. And for that, we want a mathematical proof that some properties hold. We can't just uh, enumerate cases. And um, <coughs> there is an interesting uh, thing. It's called the curie howard isomorphism, which states that types are like properties. So if you have a type, it's the same as having uh, a property in a logical system. And another thing, corollary, is that when you write a program which is uh, well-typed, it's as if you've written a proof of your property. So you don't actually write formal proofs uh, in your day-to-day -day programming when you're writing programs, but your program and your proofs have the same structure. So you have a code which is probably correct. It's, you don't write the actual uh, formal proof, but you could do if you want it, and uh, the structure is the same as, uh, as your code. 
And uh, of course, it's very good to prove stuff, but we want to prove interesting stuff. And proving interesting stuff with types mean that you have to get uh, an expressive type system. You, uh, you want to prove things that are related to uh, your business uh, constraints. So, <coughs> sorry for the typo. Um, the first and foremost uh, tool in that uh, is that uh, having uh, languages where the control structures as are typed. For instance, a language that makes impossible to uh, type go to fail, go to fail, without any error. And uh, the means to do that is to have a language where everything is an expression. For instance, uh, if uh, if block is an expression, then you are able to uh, to verify that the if branch and the else branch are the s have the same types. Um, for uh, loops, you can do the same, and this. This thing, uh, having types uh, given to control structures, it's very, very powerful. And then uh, you can have uh, some expressive types where you uh, put uh, properties that were um, implicit back in the types. Like maybe instead of having the implicit possibility of having a null value, you put it in the type and you have, uh, you have this property. Uh, you can have non-empty lists, lists that have at least one element. So, uh, for instance, if you want the, to compute the average of a list, if your list is empty, you get a division by zero error. So, when you want to compute an average, if you ask for a non-empty list, then you, are, you have a guarantee. Um, there is a very interesting thing called a new type. It's uh, available in uh, at least Haskell and, uh, and Scala. Um, it's, let's say you have an email address, usually you just uh, put it as a string in your code, but there are more strings that, than there are uh, email addresses. Uh, not every string is a, a valid email address. So, new type allows you to still store your email address as a string. At runtime you don't have any cost, but in your code you can't mix up the two. And you have a smart constructor, a function from string to maybe email. And then the only way to have uh, a value of type email is that uh, by having constructed it with this function. So when you have a value of type email, you're sure that it's, uh, that it's a, a valid email. You can't construct a, a value without the check. Another interesting thing is called type types. Uh, for instance, when we are um, dealing with, uh, let's say, distances or uh, weights, we usually uh, use floats or ints or whatever, but we just store the, the values, the amount, but we usually leave out uh, the, um, the unit. And uh, it's a famous bug because it caused a, a space, uh, space probe to crash because there are two teams, one from uh, Europe and one from uh, the US, and uh, they mixed up kilometers with miles, and the space probe crashed. So with that, you can add a tag to uh, to your types. It's uh, free at runtime, so it's just a static uh, check which is done, and then you're not able to uh, mistakenly um, confuse uh, meters with miles, and you don't have any cost at runtime. So these are all the interesting tools, but the most important tool in a type system is something called parametricity, which you may know as generics. Um, it's when you learn about it, you usually think it's a tool to uh, avoid uh, repetition. It's a, a good tool for code reuse, but it's even more than that. What is really powerful about uh, parametricity is that you don't make any assumption about uh, the types you will have. You have to explicitly state which properties you need to, to be able to use them. You whitelist the properties. So 
you, you're sure that you can't do stupid thing with the, with the type without asking for it first. Uh, simple example, we have a function from A to A. We have no idea of what uh, is the type A, so we can't do anything with it. We can construct a value, we can't do anything. So the only meaningful implementation for this function is the identity function. Since we can't uh, construct a value of type A, the only thing we can do is just give back uh, the parameter. We can't do anything else meaningfully. Um, same thing. Uh, let's say we have a function uh, which takes uh, two parameters, a function from B to C and a fun function from A to B. The result is a function from A to C. The only meanif meaningful thing we can do is uh, composing uh, G and F. We can't do anything else because we don't know anything about uh, A, B, and C. Uh, these two cases are really nice. Uh, it's called it's types which are called once inhabited because they are only one meaningful uh, implementation or behavior. Uh, but even though you don't have only one behavior, uh, you can still get interesting properties. For instance, a function from a list of A to list of A, uh, you have certain uh, properties. For instance, if you give it back, if you give it uh, an empty list, you will get back an empty list. And more generally, if there is um, a value which is present in the in the result, then you you know for sure that this value was uh, in the parameter. Because you don't know anything about the type A, you can't construct arbitrary values of type A. The only value you can produce has to be in the, in the parameter. And there is a, a very interesting paper uh, called uh, Theorems for Free, which uh, generalizes that. And uh, from uh, a just a parametric type signature, you can derive theorems about uh, the behavior. Simple example, uh, let's say we have uh, a list of A with uh, two operations, filter and map. Filter, you give it um, a predicate and it will uh, filter. It will only keep the element satisfying it. And map is uh, just a function to uh, apply a transformation to uh, every element. Um, just by looking at those types, um, you have the guarantee that mapping then filtering uh, will be equivalent to, uh, fil to filtering then mapping. And it holds for any list of any type of value, just by looking at the types. Of course, all, all these properties hold um, if you uh, have some, some disciplines, some discipline. Um, the types we, we, we see, we've seen have maybe only one uh, meaningful implementation, but the actual possible implementations are, are, are not just, uh, just this behavior. So first thing uh, which should be familiar to everybody now is that you should avoid nulls. Um, so null pointer has been called the um, billion dollar mistake by, by its uh, creator. So it should be um, it should be obvious now, but avoiding null not just about avoiding uh, null pointer exceptions. Um, if we go back to uh, our equivalence between proof and uh, programs, uh, so a property is like a type, a proof is like a program. Okay, uh, then we have null, which is a value that can inhabit any type, any type you have you put now and it will go. So if we translate it uh, into proofs and uh, properties, we have now, which is a proof that can prove any property. And by definition, a logical system where you can prove any property is an inconsistent logical system and it's useless. Um, another thing, uh, you shouldn't, shouldn't use uh, reflection for one simple reason. Parametricity works because you can't make any assumptions about your types. And when using reflection, you break that. Let's say we have a function from type A to string. By applying uh, what we know about parametricity, 
The only meaningful behavior for this function is to ignore this argument and return always the same string. Since we can't do anything with uh, the value of type A, we don't use it. And since we have to return a string, then we should return an, a constant string. We can't do anything else. Except if you use uh, reflection, where you can uh, match on the actual type of uh, what you've been given. So using reflection breaks parametricity, and uh, you can have programs with uh, very hard to predict behavior. Um, same thing, every time you use two string equals or hash code, all the methods uh, defined of, uh, on the top level object, you're breaking parametricity because your assumption is that you don't know what the type A is, then you say, I can't do anything with it. But in Java, you have a Java long object and you can do stuff with it. So it breaks parametricity too. For instance, uh, we call two string on a value, and uh, it's not a constant string. Um, no more controversial uh, stuff. Um, as advertised by the Go language, uh, it's uh, entirely feasible to not use exceptions. And the reason uh, why not to use exceptions is the same as uh, why you shouldn't use null. You can have a you can promise to provide a value of any type if you just put a throw new exception then uh, it's like you've proven any property. And uh, even more controversial stuff uh, is that like you should avoid side effects. Let's go back to our simple function. Um, if uh, we take a value from the environment or uh, we launch uh, ballistic missiles, then we break parametricity. And hopefully, uh, there is a paper called uh, Fast and Loose Reasoning is Morally Correct, which uh, shows that even though your language allows you to do these uh, stupid things, if you, if you and your team are restrained from using them, then it's almost the same as, as uh, if you've been uh, working in a safe language. So by using a little discipline within your team, you can get these benefits even though your language is not uh, enforcing it. So, which brings us to type-directed development. Uh, what is it? It's not a silver bullet, uh, even though it can be advertised as uh, the solution to everything by uh, over-enthusiastic proponents. Uh, having types does not solve um, everything, but uh, it's very, very uh, useful, and it's a very effective tool in your day-to-day -day programming. First thing that they bring is confidence. Um, a few months ago, I started a big refactoring in a, in a project. By big refactoring, I met I mean, um, I've updated a few dependencies. First one, I've updated the web frameworks that I used, and since it was a project with a lot of streaming, and the update was changing how streaming was uh, handled in the framework. It was big stuff. Then I've updated Scala Z, which is uh, like an extension of the standard library, so I used it everywhere in the program. And then, since I was there, I changed the uh, DB access library because what the heck. Um, after three days of uh, since it was a side project, I only worked on this refactoring during the night when I was uh, not very bright. And after three days of refactoring, uh, it finally compiled. I, I started with, uh, let's say, 200 compilation errors. So it's, uh, this number lowered gradually until it, uh, if it reached uh, zero. And I ran the test just to make sure, but it worked. The types had uh, caught everything. So it was, uh, I, I was frankly not very confident when starting this, uh, this refactoring, but types were quite helpful with that. And since you have guarantees about your code, you have guarantees that uh, the behavior of a function won't affect the behavior of another function, you can have modular thinking because when you are thinking about a function, 
you can forget the rest. You're just uh, thinking about what's the arguments, what's the result. The rest of the world, you, you can forget it. It's not just not relevant. But we always uh, think of types as a safety feature. Of course, it's a great safety feature, but it's so much more than that. When you are working on an algorithm, you just have to write the types of the different uh, functions, and it will lay out the structure of your code. You don't have to write the implementation yet. Just by putting down the types, you will uh, write your algorithm. And uh, there is something called whole-driven development. Uh, it's in Haskell and uh, <laughs> in, uh, in Scala. Um, let's say we want to implement this function compose from, uh, from earlier. We define a, an object called whole, which has its own type. And uh, everywhere we want to write the implementation, we start by putting this whole. It will give us a compilation error, and the compiler will tell us what, we, uh, what he expects. So we put it uh, in the body of the function. The compiler says, I want a function from A to C. OK, let's do that. We uh, put A as an uh, argument, and then the body of this function, we put the whole. Now the compiler says, hey, I want a value of type C. You look at what you have, the only way to construct a value of type C is by applying, applying G to something. OK, no whole is of type B. Then we apply F. And <coughs> now uh, the whole is of type A. The only value of type A we have is uh, X. So we got our implementation. And it was completely mechanical. Um, actually, this kind of things can be uh, decided uh, by, by a tool. In some languages, um, there is ID support to just generate the code because it has only one uh, meaningful uh, solution. Uh, we can do that with uh, fmap, which is, uh, let's say, mapping on a list. We start by having uh, a whole of type list of B. Uh, then we uh, deconstruct. Uh, since we know that every value in the result has to be uh, created from a value in the parameter, we just know that empty, empty list gives us uh, an empty list. Then uh, we deconstruct head and tail, and after uh, just iterating like that, we have our implementation. Once again, it's uh, completely mechanical. It's very useful to use this kind of techniques uh, when discovering new libraries that you don't know to use yet. You just follow the types and you get working code. So if we look at the, um, the diagram of test-driven development, uh, right green refactor, we can see that we just can apply it to type-driven development. Instead of having failing tests, we have code uh, which doesn't compile. Then we make it compile, and after that, we can refactor. And uh, if it compiles, uh, there is a good, uh, good chance of that it's correct. What's nice with types is that they make communication e easy. So of course, it makes communication easy with machines. And the obvious thing is type checking. Type checking is a compiler um, telling you that what you've done uh, is if it's correct or not. Um, also, you can have tooling, uh, tooling like in um, in the Java world, uh, your uh, IDE can f refactor stuff automatically, but it can uh, go way further. And uh, for that, one thing you should do is that you should learn Haskell type syntax. It's very simple, and uh, it's very expressive and concise. It will help you think about types. Just a crash course. Uh, if you have uh, an arrow and types uh, with lowercase, it's uh, parametric types, so A can be any type. If the type name begins with uh, an uppercase letter, it's a concrete type. So here is a function from int to int. Um, Something a bit different in Haskell than in other languages uh, is that Haskell functions have always only one argument. So if you want to have something like a function with two arguments, it's written like that. So 
it's more or less equivalent to having that. But it's, uh, you're just saying that I take one argument and I return a function taking the next argument and so on. So you can think of it as uh, asking two arguments, but it's, uh, it's much more uh, generic. Uh, something very interesting in Haskell is called type classes. Uh, it allows you to have um, ad hoc polymorphism in a restricted way. For instance, we have a list of A, a function from list of A to list of A, and the only thing we know about A is that uh, you can order value of type A. So looking at this type, the only meaningful uh, stuff is the sort. It's uh, what you give, uh, uh, you give inf enough information to uh, describe a sort. And that's what's good because you describe intent, or instead of just saying uh, types, you, uh, you give it what you expect it to do. And uh, there is a tool in the Haskell uh, platform which is called Hoogle. Uh, it's a search engine for documentation. Let's say we want to remove duplicates from a list. So type would be, I want to go from a list of A to a list of A, and the only thing I know to remove duplicates is knowing how to uh, test for equality. So we just type that into Google. And Google tells us it's a nav function. So you don't have to browse pages and pages of, uh, of documentation. You just type what you want and you get it. Uh, when I'm programming in Scala, uh, I use Google to uh, have Haskell tell me the name of the function and then I grab the name of the function in the Scala documentation. It's much more effective than just reading pages and, and pages. Another example, um, we have a list of uh, maybe A and uh, we want maybe of a list of A. Maybe it's like option. So what we want to, to have is that um, if every value in the list is defined, just return me the list of uh, defined values, and uh, if, if, if not the case, just don't uh, give me anything. So we can ask Google for that too. Uh, what's interesting is that Google will be a bit smarter than us, and it will give us a more generic type. Um, let's say sequence, it works for any monad or any object uh, which gives rise to a classic category, since it's less frightful. Uh, but types are very effective to, to work with uh, programs and machines, but it's also very useful to, to communicate with humans, and that's why we can use types uh, in untyped languages. It won't give you any help uh, from the compiler, but it will allow you to have a clear and concise uh, way of talking with the rest of your team. So, we know types can't always prove everything, so that's okay. Um, let's go back to our reverse function. So, by the types, we uh, know the properties, and uh, we can write a function uh, which takes two arbitrary lists and uh, just uh, checks that if we reverse the concatenation of uh, these two lists, it's the same as reversing uh, the second list, then uh, concatenating it with the reverse of the first list. With this property, and uh, with uh, the property of a reverse of a singleton list is, uh, is the same, um, we get back property-based testing. Okay, it's not expressed in the types, but we, all, we keep the, the property view, not the example view. So this is perfect for uh, edge cases, because uh, if you don't think about uh, um, edge cases when writing the code, you won't think uh, about it when writing the test. So you can just uh, test the specification and uh, not bother with writing manually test cases. So when doing type-directed development, you start by writing the types, then you write property-based tests, and then you write unit tests. It's a slightly different uh, testing pyramid, uh, which types at the bottom, 
uh, then property-based tests, and then unit tests. So in your day-to-day -day work, type-driven, uh, type-directed development uh, works this way. You'll start by just writing out the type of the functions, the transformation you will apply to your, to your data. Then you uh, refine them with property-based tests. So once you've uh, done that, you got operations on the type, functions, plus laws. Congrats, you've defined an algebra. So you've applied a very mathematical way of uh, designing stuff uh, with very pragmatic tools. And when you've done that, then you can figure out uh, how the data structure exists in, uh, in memory. But you, you do that only after having uh, a clear specification. And then you can implement. You optionally can unit test uh, to catch regressions. It depends. And then you profit. So to sum up, uh, what are types? First thing we all learn is that types are a safety feature. OK, nice, but not the only thing. It's also a tool which allows you to reason uh, at a very high level, almost mathematical level. And most importantly, it's a communication tool, which means you can use type-directed development even in JavaScript. You won't have tooling. Uh, you won't have uh, properties mechanically checked but you will be able to, to communicate with your team, and that's uh, the gist of writing software. So let's use them. Um, if you want to uh, learn more uh, about types, um, there is TAPL, Types and Programming Language, by Benjamin Pierce. It's the book to read about type theory. And another one is uh, Practical Foundations of uh, Programming Languages by uh, Robert Harper. Uh, these, these two books are what you need to know about type theory, if you're into it. But you may not uh, be required to, uh, to, to read these, these two books. If you want uh, practical uh, knowledge and uh, practical efficiency uh, in writing with types, uh, the book I would recommend is uh, called Functional Programming in Scala. Uh, it's a very good book. Uh, it's thorough and uh, it guides you into writing uh, functional programs. So it's, it's very interesting. And another book which is not uh, finished yet, but you can already access it with uh, Manning uh, Early uh, Access uh, Program. It's called uh, Functional and Reactive Domain Modeling uh, by Debashish Gosh. And it shows how to do domain-driven design with functional tools. So it's very interesting, and it's close to what we already do in OOP, but with functional tools. And just to finish, uh, there is a Twitter account called at Parametricity, which, is, um, which tweets um, just parametric types, and then the game is to, uh, to find out what the, what the function is doing. Um, there are slides by Tony Morris about parametricity, uh, which go on in more detail about what parametricity gives you, and the papers uh, theorems for free. Uh, reading the whole paper is is a bit hard, but uh, just reading the abstract and uh, skimming the paper is uh, is a good start. Uh, all these are links, so if you go to the GitHub repo of uh, Labdancon, you you'll get the the actual uh, links. Thanks. And uh, if you got any questions, yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, so the question was about uh, actual practical benefits of, uh, let's say, CRMs for free. Um, 
get back to the to the slide. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, um, actually, uh, the um, Haskell compiler uh, makes use of it. Um, the Haskell linter, uh, which is called hlint, uh, uses these properties to uh, suggest you cut changes. So it's actually used. And um, yeah, it's, it's an aid when you're refactoring. Uh, you can know that you keep uh, these properties. Um, and for instance, the, the reverse list, the reverse function, uh, with the properties based on types and the property uh, that I, I've written, you have a complete specification of, uh, of your function. So it just allows you to write less, 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 less tests. And uh, especially when you're using uh, functional abstractions like monads and stuff like that, these abstractions already come with that test. So if you're writing a new monad, you get the test for free. So you don't have to write, write them yourself. So yeah. OK. I think that's all. Thank you. <laughs>